Hello, everyone. We're going to give it just a minute or so to let the room populate, as we always do. But it looks like people are coming in quite quickly, which is always appreciated. Start by sharing my screen. Okay, um, everyone, you are here for our C2C Care webinar today, Keeping the Groove, Caring for Grooved Audio Media. We'll be running from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern today, so we're excited to have you. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator. I'm coming into you from Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., where it has definitely turned chilly the past couple of days. So I welcome all of you to say where you're coming from in the chat. Um, it's always fun to see that, to kind of see where everyone's calling in from today. This is our current hub on the web, connecting to collections.org. On that website, you will find a bunch of resources connected to our program. Uh, C2C Care has been around for over 10 years. We have quite the background of webinars. Um, I, I did the count the other day and I know we're in the hundreds for sure. Um, so I would say if you're interested in any kind of subject related to collections care, go check out our archives. We also have a courses archive, some of our deep dives into subjects and our link to our community. Our community is a fabulous place to ask, to ask direct care questions of a group of fabulous monitors and experts who will then look at your question and give you an answer to it. So I encourage you to go take a look at that community if you have questions related to your collections and you will probably get some excellent help there if you're interested. We have two places on social media where you can find out announcements of C2C Care. One is our Facebook site, which is Facebook slash C2C, C2C community. On that website, you will see announcements. You will also find us on the AIC LinkedIn page. We're posting announcements there as well. So if you're interested in an upcoming program, please check out Facebook and LinkedIn. A few quick technical notes, we are using Zoom meeting for this program. So you can access us or you can talk to us uh, using the chat. The chat is open to everyone. It's a great place to say hello, say where you're from, um, general comments, technical questions, any of that activity. We've also enabled the Q&A box for this webinar. Um, I do encourage you that if you have a question for a speaker at any point, please use that Q&A box. Um, it helps us track the questions throughout the program. Um, and as you can see, the chat does become a bit of a stream of consciousness. So it's always nice to kind of have the Q&A to refer to for questions. We've also enabled captioning today. So if you would like that service, hit the CC button and you will see our fabulous captioner working hard, hard away. And a couple of quick upcoming programming notes. Um, we have our final C2C Care webinar of 2024, which is called Contamination and Pesticide Residues for Small and Mid-Sized Cultural Institutions. It's actually happening next Tuesday. November 19th from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, this program is a little preview of a course we're planning on running end of January to February, all about finding contaminations and pesticide residues in collections, specifically people dealing with tribal collections or maybe collections who have dealt with that issue. Um, the webinar next week is going to feature four speakers just talking about the basics of this process. And then our course, which the courses, you do need to pay a small fee to join in on, but will be a deep dive into that subject where you will learn from a group of fabulous experts from the museum field, the tribal museum field and tribal governments just about that subject, which seems to be very hot right now. So I would encourage you to join that free webinar next week if you may be interested in the course. And then our first webinar in 2025 is care of newspaper clippings. We're going back old school. Um, people, lots of small and mid-sized have those newspaper clippings in their collection. And we have a speaker from the National Archives coming in to talk to us a bit about how to care for them and to store them. So I would encourage you to register for that program as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce our speaker today. His name is Dave Walker. He's audiovisual archivist, the Smithsonian Institution Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Today, we're gonna to be talking all about groove media, things such as wax cylinders, shell actus, and vinyl records, and kind of how we can deal with storing them and all that kind of fun issues that we have within a small and mid-sized institution. So Dave, feel free to take over and we will see you all during the Q&A. Sure, thank you so much, Robin. Uh, this is really exciting to get to speak with you all today about a subject I and my colleagues are really passionate about, uh, caring for grooved audio media. So about me, I'm an audiovisual archivist and professional media conservator uh, working at the Smithsonian Institution. 
I specialize in uh, preservation of analog audio recording formats and am an, a passionate educator about uh, preserving audiovisual media in general. Um, I'm part of the Association for Recorded Sound Collections Technical Committee, uh, and I think it's really important for to share knowledge um, about these precious artifacts from the past 100 plus years. So in today's webinar, we'll be covering some of the key aspects of preserving groove media formats, including wax cylinders, shellac discs, vinyl records, and more. These unique materials are often found in museums, archives, and special collections. And each format uh, presents its own preservation challenges. So our goals today are to take a close look at the different types of groove media and discuss their distinct physical characteristics. We're also gonna wanna identify common forms of deterioration. So groove media can face various risks over time from physical wear to environmental damage. And by understanding these vulnerabilities, we can better plan for their preservation. We're also gonna explore best practices for handling storage and cleaning. So we'll dive into practical aspects of caring for these materials, covering techniques that extend the life of each format and ensure their preservation for future generations. And finally, we'll, do, uh, we'll look at risk assessments for groove media and talk about specific risks that the material face, uh, like temperature fluctuations, physical handling, and exposure to, uh, to pollutants, as well as strategies uh, for mitigating these risks. But why the focus on audio recordings? Well, audio recordings are among the earliest forms of time-based media <clears throat> and can be found in collections dating from the late 19th century through today. Unlike paintings, prints, and photographs, they capture dynamic moments in time, preserving voice, music, languages, you know, across cultures and generations. So from traditional songs to spoken histories, these recordings can connect uh, generations to their past. Um, you also have, uh, you know, a lot of community interaction with these materials as well. So they offer insight uh, into diverse ways of life and allow future generations to experience cultural expressions that might otherwise be lost. So by preserving the carriers uh, of these voices and sounds, we maintain a direct connection to the cultural identities of the past, ensuring that future generations can listen, learn, and continue to appreciate their heritage. And beyond cultural significance, audio recordings can also hold historical and scientific value. Uh, they document technological advancements in sound recordings, reflect societal shifts, and even provide data for linguistic and acoustic analysis which can help researchers understand language evolution and changes in the natural world, for example. So, but what is grooved media? Well, the term grooved media encompasses a category of analog audio recordings that capture sound as a physical groove inscribed on the surface of a medium, such as a cylinder or a disc. These grooves contain the audio information, typically in a continuous single line. Playback requires precise alignment of a stylus, so a needle that traces the groove making audible sound. Proper positioning of the stylus is essential for accurate sound reproduction and to avoid damaging the recording surface. So that's groove media in a nutshell. Now, when we're talking about grooves, there's two main types. So the earliest ones uh, are often called the hill and dale grooves or vertically cut grooves. Um, which move up and down along the groove's paths. Uh, this was common in early wax cylinders and some early disc formats. Uh, this image is a close-up of a vertically cut groove uh, with a long scratch you can see along the groove surface. And on the other hand, laterally cut grooves move side to side, which is the standard for most flat discs, including vinyl records. Encoding sound waves in the side-to-side -side movement yields better sound quality than the older Hillendale method and allowed uh, the grooves to be shrunken down. Uh, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So our first format we'll look at are wax cylinders. Uh, they were introduced in the late 1880s and served as both a recording and playback medium. And they marked the first uh, commercially available sound recordings. Um, <clears throat> they were at least the first most popular ones and they are created by inscribing grooves into soft wax. In the early 1900s, plastic cylinders made out of celluloid 
began to replace wax as a more durable option, and they are sometimes marketed as indestructible records. Plastic cylinders, like the iconic Edison Blue Amberol, which we see on the right here, were produced from around 1908 until the late 1920s. While celluloid offered greater resistance to wear and, and environmental damage, both wax and plastic cylinders are still fragile and require specialized preservation to prevent deterioration. So wax cylinders are, are fragile and highly susceptible to physical and environmental damage. And over time, exposure to moisture can lead to fungal growth and other biological growth, which can eat away at the grooves, ruining the audio content. The soft surface also means these cylinders are vulnerable to scratches and the wear of the groove over time, uh, which degrades the sound quality each time they're played. And the wax composition of the medium may also become brittle over time and make it prone to cracking. Because of these vulnerabilities, wax cylinders require special handling and storage. They must be stored in a stable, low temperature, low humidity environment to slow the rate of deterioration. Additionally, they need to be handled carefully, avoiding contact with the grooves to prevent further wear or contamination. And before handling wax cylinders, you always want to inspect for cracks, mold, or other signs of deterioration. Because if damage is present, you want to minimize handling and consult a preservation specialist. Uh, if the cylinder has fragile spots, try to avoid placing your fingers near those areas to prevent making the problem worse. So prior to handling, wax cylinders should be brought to room temperature first before touching. And this is because the thermal shock from the warmth of your hands is known to cause cold wax cylinders to split. Uh, it's been documented, so you want to make sure you know, to bring those up to room temperature if you're retrieving them from cold storage, for example. You're also going to want to support by the edges or insert your fingers inside. So hold wax cylinders by their edges or insert two fingers inside for support. Avoid placing pressure on the grooves as these areas contain the audio content and are very malleable. You also want to use both hands with a gentle grip when handling to ensure stability and reduce the risk of dropping. And you'll want to rotate the cylinder. So as mentioned before, these cylinders are fragile and can crack under pressure. When handling for prolonged periods of time, such as when doing an inspection, you're going to want to rotate the cylinder gradually to prevent heat-induced cracking, chipping, and other mishaps. And in terms of storage and housing, um, the first thing that you want to make sure is you want to strive for an environment that is cool. So um, the published recommendations, uh, and which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, for wax cylinders ranges from 40 degrees to 54 degrees Fahrenheit, so 4 to 12 degrees centigrade, for long-term preservation and stability. And you're going to want to aim for a stable relative humidity between 30 and 50 percent, as the fluctuations can cause uh, warping and cracking. You're going to want to store cylinders in a dark environment to also prevent material degradation from light exposure. And you're going to want to store cylinders vertically by placing it upright on the ends like a drinking glass to prevent warping and minimize surface pressure. And you can use supportive containers such as acid-free archival boxes uh, with individual cylindrical baffles or supports. Metal edge boxes or custom polycarbonate containers can be used to protect and cushion each cylinder. On the right, you can see the ARSC, A-R-S-C, archival cylinder box made of inert polycarbonate, which has been specifically designed for the protection of, long, uh, of wax cylinders in long-term collection storage. You'll want to also avoid wood cabinets and instead opt for metal or archival quality shelving to avoid the acidic off-gassing and pest activity that can come with using wooden cabinets. It's also a good idea to apply external labels to storage boxes to minimize handling and reduce unnecessary contact with cylinders. And you'll also want to reduce unnecessary movement to decrease the risk of physical damage. 
that may also involve periodically checking uh, the storage environment and the cylinder condition for issues like mold, pest activity, or structural wear. And if you're crafty, you can also build um, custom enclosures for wax cylinders. Um, this is just one design uh, using acid-free barrier board. Um, you can get creative with it. Uh, it's a good idea to try to keep the original cylinder, so the medium with the audio on it, with its uh, cylinder uh, housing, the original housing, um, if there's something written on it. Um, but just be mindful that the, they're made of different materials, so they have different uh, risks associated with them. Um, the housings themselves can be source of food for bugs, for example, um, who like to eat the cotton or the baffling that's inside, um, or eat at the organic uh, adhesives that were used, like the wheat paste and stuff, to apply the labels. So um, just keep that in mind as well. And with regard to cleaning, so you're always going to want to practice safe handling, as discussed before, and avoid touching the grooves. Um, the oils from your fingers can contaminate and damage the delicate wax. Uh, if, if you must do dry cleaning, use, soft, uh, use a soft natural bristle brush, such as camel hair, to gently brush dust and dirt off of the grooves. Always brush in the direction of the grooves to avoid scratching or displacing the wax. Uh, and if you need to spot clean for stubborn degree, uh, stubborn debris, you can use a lightly dampened soft cloth with distilled water, and you can gently dab at any persistent spots, avoiding excessive moisture. The general rule of thumb is never submerge the cylinder in water or apply pressure when cleaning, um, as this wax is highly sensitive. And you'll want to avoid uh, using solvents, alcohol, or chemical cleaners on wax cylinders as, the, as these can dissolve or degrade the base medium. And after cleaning, store cylinders in acid-free archival quality containers with vertical supports to protect them further for, uh, from contamination and minimize handling needs. And if you're curious, there's some great videos online that show how wax cylinders are actually made. Uh, there's a bit of a niche enthusiast community for the format um, people are still recording on them uh, for fun. It's, it's really great. <laughs> so next up are uh, the Shellac 78 RPM discs. So these discs, often called 78s, due to their standard playback speed of 78 rotations per minute, uh, were widely used from the late 1890s to the 1950s as the primary format for commercial music recordings. Shellac discs get their name from their key ingredient, shellac resin, which is derived from the secretions of the lac beetle. Uh, this resin is harvested and processed, then combined with fillers like clay, limestone, fibers, or other materials to create the hard, durable material used for shellac discs. The lac beetle's resin was chosen for its rigidity and resilience allowing grooves to maintain their shape much longer than grooves made out of wax. The most common sizes for shellac discs include 7-inch, 10-inch, 12-inch, and less common 16-inch diameters. Originally, rotation speeds vary, varied widely, uh, but by 1910, most discs were recorded at approximately 78 to 80 uh, rotations per minute. In 1925, a standard of 17.26 rotations per minute was chosen for motorized phonographs, making 78s a standard term that distinguished these records from newer formats after World War II. And of course, there's always you know, exceptions to this. There were discs created decades later at faster speeds, slower speeds, that sort of stuff. But we're talking the broad brush strokes here. And so the 10 inch discs were the most popular for commercial releases, generally holding between th around three minutes of audio per side, while 12 inch discs could hold between four and five minutes. Most Shellac 78s were sold in paper or cardboard sleeves with a circular cutout for the label and typically only provided a minimal amount of additional information. 
The discs themselves had pressed in labels, unlike later vinyl records, uh, which glued the labels um, to the surface. And despite their durability compared to earlier wax formats, shellac discs are still vulnerable to damage due to their rigidity. They're brittle and prone to shattering if dropped or mishandled. Additionally, they can suffer surface wear over time, especially with repeated playback, which can degrade the sound quality. Like earlier formats, shellac discs are also susceptible to surface contamination from dirt, dust, and mold, which can abrade the grooves and impair playback. Here are some close-ups I took of a shellac disc's groove through a microscope, both before and after cleaning. And so handling. So you're gonna to wanna to support uh, a 78 uh, properly by its edges um, or hold, hold support both the middle and edges to avoid contact with the grooves. Avoid excess pressure because shellac is rigid and brittle. Um, also avoid flexing or pressing on the surface as this can cause cracks or shattering. You'll wanna handle discs in a stable temperature environment, ideally between 40 and 54 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent brittleness from temperature shifts. And you'll want to minimize unnecessary handling and playback as the groove, grooves wear down with repeated use. Some practical ways of doing this are to have multiple physical copies, or better yet, digitally preserved audio uh, to serve as the access file. And with regards to storage, you'll want to always store disks upright in metal shelving and avoid wooden shelving to prevent exposure to acidic off-gassing and pests. Uh, like we discussed for wax cylinders. For permanent collections, store discs at around 40 to 54 degrees Fahrenheit and 30 to 50 RH. Avoid fluctuations uh, to prevent cracking or crazing of the surface. And you'll want to use acid-free archival paper inner sleeves. Replace original sleeves if they're acidic or damaged. And for added protection, you can store the resleeve discs in metal edge archival boxes. And with regards to cleaning, you always want to check for cracks or surface deterioration first. Um, fragile discs may be too delicate for even dry cleaning, so just keep that in mind. Uh, use a soft, lint-free cloth or natural bristle brush to gently remove dust and debris. Compressed air can also be used to blow off surface dust. You'll want to avoid water and solvents as they can cause swelling or deterioration. Uh, wet cleaning should only be done by trained professionals when appropriate. And the reason for this is because 78s, they were made by so many different companies and some used natural fibers um, as the fillers uh, to create the discs. So some of those natural fibers can expand and swell um, if exposed to water uh, and can permanently alter uh, the, the shape and the playback of those discs. So be very careful if you're going to be using any sort of um, aqueous solution for cleaning the discs. And you'll want to gently brush uh, dust off the surface regularly before storage uh, to reduce the buildup and avoid abrasion during playback. And this is where I want to give a little disclaimer and just say that there's many anecdotal suggestions, solutions, and commercial cleaning machines in the world of record collecting, um, some based on objective science, um, some totally made up. Uh, and these solutions are as old as the mediums themselves. So there's you know hundreds of different recommendations out there by record collectors about, oh, you know, to get the, the cleanest record, use this type of glue or that sort of thing. So I just want to put it out there. It's always important to approach non-peer reviewed recommendations with caution. Uh, and so when in doubt, consult a professional. Um, so everything we're going to be discussing today uh, comes from Library of Congress recommendations, um, peer reviewed articles about the long term longevity of formats. Uh, so we're going to keep it uh, general and based on uh, the, the published literature. And so uh, for our next format we're going to discuss uh, are lacquer discs, often called acetates or instantaneous discs. 
Uh, these were widely used from the late 1920s all the way up to the 1970s and later for both recording and playing back audio. They consist of a nitrocellulose or acetate coating uh, layered over a core, typically made of aluminum, glass, or cardboard. And like wax cylinders, Lacquer discs both served as both a recording and a playback medium, and often captured unique one-of-a-kind recordings, such as ephemeral radio broadcast or in-studio uh, takes, that sort of thing. So to create a lacquer disc, an engineer would use a lathe to engrave sound directly onto the disc surface. This process, known as direct cut recording, using, uses a cutting stylist on the lathe to carve grooves into the lacquer layer etching the audio in real time. A small vacuum is often used alongside the stylus to clear away excess material or swarf as it peels up during the recording process. And the more common sizes you'll find in collections include 10 inch, 12 inch, 13 or 16 inch. Although atypical, smaller and larger discs can be found in collections. Uh, multiple spindle holes in the center are typical of these discs and the discs themselves came in many bold trademark colors and label graphics. And so they were sold as blanks and then used to record audio either in a studio or out in the field. And this format is particularly vulnerable to damage. Um, and I will say these discs are often uh, miscataloged as vinyl records, uh, so it's, always important to double check, uh, especially if you have uh, sleeves that are, you know, not original, you know, commercially printed sleeves, but are like paper sleeves uh, with little information, um, because you might end up discovering that you have a lacquer disc. Uh, and these are some of the things that can happen to it. Um, so they're particularly vulnerable to damage and the lacquer coating can shrink and delaminate from its core over time especially when exposed to high humidity and which causes a total loss of information. So here's an example of crazing starting to take place on the right side of the disc. And here's an example of delamination on a lacquer with a metal base. You can see the, the metal base up there. And another example of delamination on a lacquer with a glass base. Um, glass was substituted um, was a substitution for metal during World War II. Um, and so there was a period where the discs being manufactured are glass-based, um, which are very rare and fragile and have their own uh, preservation concerns. So these glass discs can just fracture um, and come turn into pieces. So you gotta be careful with those. And lacquer discs are also prone to plasticizer loss which appears as a whitish powder or a crystalline deposit on the surface. And it's often mistaken for mold. So like 78s, you're gonna want to handle them with extreme care. Um, always handle by the edges or label area to avoid direct contact with the grooves. Avoid wearing gloves. And the reason for this is they can reduce your tactile sense and impede your grip. So the more preferred method is just ensuring that you have clean hand, clean and dry hands um, prior to handling. So it's similar if you're uh, like a collections manager working with glass objects. Um, as you know, like the gloves can impede with your ability to provide that uh, you know tight grip on the object. And let's see. So when inspecting or transporting uh, a, a lacquer disc. You want to use a flat, supportive surface to prevent flexing, which can lead to additional cracks or delamination. And in general, try to minimize handling to reduced wear. Uh, lacquer discs should only be handled when necessary, such as for preservation. And if a lacquer disc shows sign of delamination or cracking, avoid playback as it may worsen the condition and cause irreparable damage. And what, what to do if you have a damaged disc? Well, if a disc is cracked or flaking and needs to be inspected on both sides, you'll wanna place the disc between two boards and carefully flip it over so that the disc is completely supported throughout. 
be mindful of these flakes that can fall off the lacquer disc and see the ARS guide to audio preservation chapter on care and maintenance for more information. You, you can go to page 53 for that. And storage. So you can use similar storage solutions for lacquers as you do for shellacs. So for lacquer discs, always rehouse discs using acid-free archival quality sleeves that allow for air circulation. So plastic sleeves should generally be avoided as they can trap moisture exacerbating delamination and plasticizer loss. Paper sleeves are preferable um, if they are acid-free and PAT tested. So for additional protection and buffering, you can also store discs in metal edge enclosures with spacers for stability, like we see here. And cleaning. So why should we clean lacquer discs? Well, cleaning lacquer discs improves the audio quality uh, upon playback by removing the dirt and the plasticizer deposits, which can obscure audio features, um, especially during digitization. So cleaning may also prevent the buildup of deposits that can cause discs to fuse to the sleeves in long-term storage. Um, there's a great resource assembled by the uh, Northeast Document Conservation Center called Cleaning Lacquer Discs. Um, if you have these discs in your collection, um, I encourage you to check it out. So the general process for that um, is as follows. So first you wanna check the surface for cracking or delamination and avoid cleaning damaged discs. You wanna use a sturdy label protector to prevent moisture from damaging adhesive labels. You'll then rinse with distilled deionized water to remove loose particles. You'll spray with a cleaning solution consisting of 0.5% tergitol uh, 15-S-7 and water and allow the solution to sit for two to five minutes. For extreme plasticizer breakdown, you may add 0.1% ammonium hydroxide to the mix. And after cleaning with the solution, gently wipe along the grooves with the, the um, soft groove brush. You'll want to rinse again thoroughly with cool deionized water. You can pat dry with a microfiber cloth and place in a drying rack for up to 30 minutes. And once dry, re-sleeve in a fresh archival sleeve. So in a nutshell, that's how you would hand clean a lacquer disc. And so next we'll talk about vinyl discs or sometimes called LPs. So vinyl records were introduced in the late 1940s and remain the most common grooved media today. And they're widely used for both new and archival audio releases. Made from polyvinyl chloride, PVC, these records are more flexible and durable than shellac discs, making them less prone to shattering. Vinyl's smooth, resilient surface allows for high fidelity playback and supports the finer micro grooves that characterize modern recordings. So vinyl records gained popularity in the post-war period as improved recording technology allowed for the creation of stereo sound and long playing formats. By the 1950s, 12 inch uh, vinyl LPs at 33 and a third rotations per minute became the standard for full length albums, while seven inch records at 45 rotations per minute were widely used for singles. Vinyl's adaptability to various speeds and formats made it an ideal medium for a range of musical styles and genres. And vinyl records are produced in three main sizes. You've got your seven inch singles, typically played at 45 rotations per minute with around three to five minutes per side. And they were commonly used for single song releases. Now, these can be found in classic jukebox machines. And one of the features to identify uh, these discs are the large center hole. And that was key for um, integrating into jukeboxes because they had a, a large metal clamp that would come down and um, you know, center it. And you also had 10 inch EPs. These often played at 45 or, or 33 and a third rotations per minute. And they were used for extended play records, though less common compared to other sizes. And the 12 inch LPs played at 33 and a third rotations per minute holding around 20 to 30 minutes per side, 
um, making it the preferred format for commercial albums. It is perhaps the most uh, familiar format to all of us. And then characteristics of vinyl records. So vinyl's composition allows for narrow micro grooves, which offer extended play time and audio, high audio fidelity compared to earlier formats. Its smooth, flexible surface is more resistant to cracking and breakage, although still susceptible to de deterioration. So the flexibility of vinyl allows it to withstand normal handling without breaking, but its non-brittle material uh, makes them relatively hardy. Um, however, vinyl records are prone to surface contamination like dust, oils, and mold, which can degrade sound quality over time. Environmental factors such as heat and humidity can cause the plastic to warp, leading to playback issues like skipping. Uh, additionally, frequent playback with a worn or misaligned stylus can create micro damage in the grooves, gradually dulling sound clarity. And when you're handling, storing, uh, housing and cleaning vinyls, you'll always wanna hold records by the edges to avoid fingerprints and oils on the grooves. Store vinyl vertically in a stable environment with low light exposure. Replace old plastic sleeves with acid-free, high-density polyethylene sleeves. Avoid sticky or tacky plastic lined sleeves as these can deteriorate vinyl over time. You can use a soft anti-static brush before each play to remove dust. For deeper cleaning, apply a gentle solution of distilled water and a non-abrasive detergent with a microgroove brush. Avoid alcohol-based solutions as these can damage the vinyl material over time. And another tip, the original factory shrink wrap can damage the disc if it's left on. This cheap uh, plastic wrap will continue to shrink and deform over time uh, which can have you know, disastrous effects on the disc inside. So it's safer to replace factory shrink wrap with an appropriate archival uh, jacket sleeve when putting vinyls into permanent collection storage. And I also wanted to mention that there are various record cleaning machines out there, including do-it-yourself options made from off-the-shelf parts. Uh, most machines operate similarly using a microgroove brush and a detergent applicator to deeply clean into the grooves. A separate vacuum then suctions away the dirt, uh, the dirty water, ensuring little residue gets left behind. These can be real time savers if you have hundreds of discs to clean, such as uh, before digitization. And while we've covered uh, the most common types of groove media, you may encounter other more unusual formats in your collections, such as flexible soundscriber recording discs, uh, Dictabelt bands, large wax cylinders, Edison diamond discs, or Pathé discs from France, also Vitaphone discs. Also, there's at least two copies out there of the, the Voyager Space Probe's Golden Record, which is currently in, in interstellar space. And this is probably one of my personal favorites, sometimes called bones or rib records. Essentially, these are artifacts left over from the former Soviet Union where band music was distributed on bones. So uh, recordings etched onto discarded x-ray film. Pretty neat, huh? So check out the, there's a TED Talk link below to hear a cool story. And I'll hold up to my camera here. This is, this is what it looks like close up. You've got, um, a thin film, flexible film um, that can be cut into using a lathe. Um, and it was a very inventive uh, process, you know, ingenious to be able to take something like leftover x-ray film and actually record something onto it. And so in the next section, we're gonna talk about risk assessments. Um, and so it's important to be proactive and to conduct risk assessments to reduce deteriorates, deterioration rates for these objects and ensure future accessibility. Grooved media and other formats can be affected by several types of risks, including physical forces. For example, earthquakes, mishandling, and vibrations from nearby construction. They can all damage these recordings. 
Lacquer discs in particular are vulnerable to cracking, chipping, and delamination when exposed to physical stress. So to prevent these issues, reduce the impact of vibrations by storing them on sturdy shelving and using archival housings, padding, or other support to keep media stable and secure. Another risk is theft. Uh, many historic recordings and rare commercial items are considered valuable collectibles and can be targets for theft. Some recordings can fetch high prices in the collector's market, such as Elvis Presley's first recording, uh, which was made as a gift for his mother, which sold for 300,000 in 2015. So deter, um, to deter theft and loss, use secure labeling tracking systems and restrict access by storing high value items in secure areas. Additionally, fire and water are major threats to these collections. Fire can cause complete loss of collections while water damage from leaks, flooding, or sprinkler malfunctions can destroy recordings entirely. To mitigate these risks, use waterproof enclosures where appropriate, inspect storage areas regularly, and relocate items away from high risk areas whenever possible. This obviously should be included in your broader uh, disaster recovery uh, plan for your collections. So just you know, keep in mind, fire and water can also affect records. Uh, pest and pollutants pose another threat, especially to organic materials like wax cylinders and shellac discs. Uh, rodents, insects, and mold can damage these materials, which airborne particulates can accelerate surface damage. To prevent these issues, implement pest control strategies air filtration systems, and store items in sealed, climate-controlled environments to minimize contamination and exposure. Environmental conditions, uh, such as exposure to UV light, temperature fluctuations, and shift in humidity can warp, crack, or degrade items over time. To safeguard collections, keep storage environments as stable as possible, avoiding unnecessary light and maintaining consistent temperatures and humidity levels. Finally, um, neglect and poor documentation practices can erode the historical context and associations of recordings, making it difficult to maintain their provenance and significance. To mitigate this, it's ass essential to catalog items regularly, perform routine inspections, and maintain comprehensive contextual information to uphold the historical integrity of each recording. And uh, just talking about like collectible records, um, not too long ago, uh, the very first edition of the Beatles White Album was sold for almost $800,000. Um, it was from like Ringo Starr's personal collection. Uh, but it just goes to show you that sometimes something as simple as a record on a shelf might have, uh, you know, <laughs> might need to be insured uh, or covered by a separate insurance policy. Um, than what you have for your collections. Also, records can be tasty snacks for pests. Um, this is a record we had as part of a collection that obviously could not uh, formally be acquired because it was already too damaged. And then uh, in our short few minutes here, I'll just mention, uh, point back to the ideal storage conditions for long-term preservation. This is based on this international standard, ANSI IT 913 from 1996, um, which provides recommendations for if you have collections that you know uh, need to be preserved at least a minimum of, of 10 years, um, these are the recommended temperature, humidity, and fluctuation limits for that. And if you have collections that need to last a lot longer than that, so for permanent collections, you're gonna to wanna to bring that temperature down and restrict that uh, relative humidity um, and have even smaller fluctuations. And so general best practices um, in a nutshell, I'll say uh, we already discussed, like, you know, handle these records um, and cylinders with care, typically by, from their edges and using additional supports if needed. Um, use clean hands and avoid using gloves that may reduce uh, your tactile sense. Maintain a stable, cool environment to reduce the risk of warping, cracking, or mold. Avoid fluctuations in temperature and humidity and store materials vertically in supportive enclosures. 
Use archival quality housing, so choose acid-free archival quality sleeves and containers. Use materials that allow for air circulation when needed, especially for lacquer and shellac discs. Avoid plastic sleeves that can trap moisture for, this, for those formats. Minimize exposure to light pollution, uh, light and pollution, and uh, regular cleaning and inspection. So you can use you know, soft anti-static brush to remove dust before playback. Clean media with non-abrasive solutions. Inspect materials periodically for signs of deterioration like mold and delamination. And prioritize digitization efforts. So really for long-term accessibility, digitize valuable and fragile items. Digitize, uh, digitization allows for safe playback and reduces handling of the originals. Unique or rare items should be prioritized for preser preservation reformatting to prevent irreversible loss. So digitize collections based on value, fragility, and condition to ensure long-term accessibility. And you can maintain duplicates of commercial recordings for safe playback and to reduce the handling of the originals. And in less than 30 seconds, I will just uh, describe uh, emerging tech. So um, Irene, so caring for your recordings now is essential because without proactive preservation, we risk losing these valuable audio recordings uh, forever. As these materials age, their physical and chemical vulnerabilities increase, and over time, some recordings can deteriorate to a point where traditional playback is no longer possible. That being said, there are some exciting new technologies emerging, such as laser-based playback systems, which can read and reproduce sound from broken or delicate recordings without direct contact. These advancements offer hope for damaged collections, but they also highlight the importance of, of assessing and prioritizing collections for preservation and digitization before deterioration sets in too deeply. Preserving these recordings now ensures they remain accessible and intact for future generations. And so um, here are some additional resources, which I think Robin already shared, um, but these are like canonical texts on caring for audiovisual media, specifically groove media. And my slides also include um, the image credits there. So I think now we're ready to jump into a Q&A. We are, and there's been quite a few questions coming in. So I'm gonna jump oh to them. Um, they're all good, <laughs> like, cause you covered a lot of information. I was actually wondering though, uh, well, two things. I dropped into the chat a link to resources. So on that website, eventually will be the recording. We also posted a copy of your presentation and then a link of to the resources that you mentioned in your PowerPoint um, and a link to the survey for this program too, because I always like to throw that out there early. Um, since we just came back though, I was wondering if you could hold up the really cool record slash x-ray again, because it's just kooky <laughs> like to look at it, so. Yeah. Oh, your sound. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah. You can still find these um, if you're ever traveling in Eastern Europe. <laughs> Sometimes they show up on eBay. Yeah, someone in the chat was mentioning it, and I was, she was, they were like, "It's awesome," and I was like, "Agreed." <laughs> like, I was like, "I thought it was awesome too." Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, also show up. These are stunt doubles, so not from like the national collections. These are things that I found at flea markets. But like, this is an example of a lacquer disc. That's cute. It's seven inches, you know? So this is a really small recording, um, probably done at home, you know, on like a Sears Roebuck machine or something like that. <laughs> so you never know what you're going to find. And uh, again, like the lacquer discs, they look a lot like vinyl records. So this is a lacquer also in a flea market, you know, amongst all these classical recordings. This was a, a recording of a radio show in 1959 which may not exist elsewhere. So not bad for 25 cents. <laughs> very cool, very cool. But we had a lot of questions just talking about storage. So I think I wanna hit those again because a lot of people were asking the kind of the same thing. So uh, mm -hmm. one general question we got was just cold or cool storage recommended. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and what the ranges are again. Yeah, sure. So um, I will always uh, point back to the Library of Congress's um, recommendations, which you can go to loc.gov, uh, 
preservation care record. Um, that's the first, uh, no, sorry, the second bullet point on the resource list. Um, and so there's specific recommendations for uh, if you have collections that you know you want to save for 10 years, right? Between 65 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit with a, a RH between 45 and 50. Now that's that's pretty close to room temperature. We would not call that cold. Um, that's certainly even above cool. Um, but that is the kind of the bare minimum for things uh, ten at least ten years. Um, however, if you have collections that you know it's the original recording of Sally Ride or Edison talking, you certainly want to have it a lot colder than that, but not too cold because uh, specifically 46 de degrees is recommended as the lower threshold um, for these materials, in part because often we have mixed collections, like uh, there's magnetic tapes that might sit alongside grooved audio recordings, and you don't want to bring magnetic tapes below 46 because of um, the plasticizers that are used um, to, to keep the oxide together with the surface um, you know, of that plastic uh, can cause, there can be some funky things if you go below uh, 46. So in general, you'd want to also avoid uh, going below 46 for like cell the celluloid uh, cylinders or potentially anything that could have plastic fillers in it that you're not sure of. So cool is better for longer term. Um, but if you stick with the ANSI recommendations of 65 to 70 and 45 to 50, you can slow the rate of deterioration, you know, for a minimum of 10 years. Would you recommend that for wax cylinders as well? Because someone mentioned that in the questions too. They said, what temp should wax cylinders be stored at? Yeah, so um, in the, uh, uh, let me let me just go back here real quick because there are there are some sources that say you can go down to 40 degrees between 40 and 54 um, degrees fahrenheit for long-term preservation and stability so but i do want to stress that if you're going below 46 um, degrees and you also have other like plastics like magnetic tape in there um, you do run the risk of there being damage so does that yeah does that no i think okay. i think that's what they were looking for we had quite a few people talking also just about enclosures and having questions about them so um someone has with vinyl records can the acid-free paper slash board sleeves be used as well or only polyethylene uh, for vinyls yes uh sure yeah yeah you can use the the vinyl um the the polyethylene is recommended uh because they can be designed uh, to be anti-static and to cut down on just the, the, the buildup of static. Um, but you can certainly use the archival sleeves. Uh, just keep in mind, nothing is, uh, housings are not permanent. They're not intended to be permanent. Um, so even if you have something that is inert, uh, it is exposed to the in environment. So within 10 to 15 years, you may have to go and replace all those sleeves again. I mean, that's major institutions deal with this all the time. You know, housings are only as good as the environment that you're putting them in. Uh, so you may have to replace sleeves far, you know, sooner um, because if you have collections stored in a space where it is exposed to, um, you know, contaminants in the air, um, like VOCs and stuff, then you want to avoid, um, you know, don't just rely on your housing protecting it uh, forever. So you want to keep an eye on them. Yeah. Kind of related to that, someone asked, can vinyl discs be housed in paper sleeves that are acid-free slash pass the PAT test? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another one. Someone was asking about just storage. So is there any way to store shellac or vinyl discs horizontally if for example if for instance you have a pretty large disc that doesn't fit on a shelf vertically that's a great question and um the reason why it's recommended to store things uh vertically is to avoid excess pressure on the grooves uh but there have been some great 
DIY housing is created by, um, I think at Harvard, uh, they created a special uh, horizontal disc. Uh, it, it's kind of like a little sandwich. Um, it, you, you put the disc on it and then it folds over and then you can fit like five discs in like an extra box. Um, these are for discs that are damaged, for example, where you wouldn't even want to store it vert uh, vertically. So yeah, you can certainly do that. Just keep in mind that uh, you're going to want to do everything possible to avoid anything touching the groove. So that might involve, um, for example, since we have this handy, we have the three spindle holes on this lacquer. If you put three or four pegs, right, you can suspend it so that mm -hmm. it's never actually touching the bottom of the box or the top of the box. So it is possible. Excellent. I just, a vision popped into my head of those little uh, tables they used to put with pizza so that she oh, was pizza hit the top. Yeah, like that popped into my head when you were describing mm -hmm. it. And I was like, the pizza tables. So not, don't use the pizza tables, everyone. <laughs> but like, this popped into my head when you were describing that. Um, someone has, I noticed that since you were supposed to replace the paper, paper cardboard slip, do you retain those slips separately or do you discard them? Um, and then someone kind of said, also, do you recommend saving the paper sleeves? I understand not storing the discs in those, but do you think they have historic value? So kind of that outside enclosure, the original one, what do you recommend with those? Absolutely. Yeah, it's going to really depend on, um, you know, your collection and your collecting practices. Your also like just capacity to double the footprint of your collection, right? You're doubling the footprint if you're removing those sleeves and replacing them with something else. Um, in some cases, the sleeves are as much as part of the artifact as the record itself. And, you know, maybe there's doodles, maybe there's metadata, um, maybe it just in some way tells the story of the artifact. Um, seems like a good idea to keep those. Um, maybe they could be used for exhibition. Um, one of our practices is to photograph the sleeves. So we photograph the discs and the sleeves um, using an overhead camera mount system. That's very common for flat and 2D materials. Um, and you can always retain that, that digital image um, of the sleeve without necessarily having to, you know, keep that, that thing around. So, you know, archives, uh, I think that, that does distinguish one feature between archives and museums in, this is just a general um, kind of summary is like, you know, our, as archivists, uh, we are not afraid to weed collections if there's things that need to be weeded out. Uh, so that includes things like, things written on napkins that are, or on, uh, onion paper, you know, things that were made on old carbon copy machines, that sort of thing. So it's the, the content is the, uh, the artifact rather than the physical material itself. Right. So I think it's case by case basis, but if you were to, um, replace the sleeve and not hang on to it, um, because there's no extra information by all means. Yeah. yeah, that that's something I always uh, talk to my archivist friends about is I'm always I'm, I'm a touch jealous of weeding policies <laughs> because <laughs> for like deaccession policies, it's like oh, it's a huge thing, right, where you have to sit there and get approval and all that. And you guys have weeding policies already on the books. Um, not we have deaccessioning policies on the books as well, but it's just it's just a more of a part of the life of the institution, I feel like, than with museums who tend to want to just like hold on to everything for the entire time. So I'm always very like, man, we would need to integrate some of that some days because it's such a struggle for us. Um, so we had a couple of people, and I think this is a good thing to wrap up on, just like, how do you tell the difference between all these types of media types, right? So we have someone asking, um, is there a quick, easy way to tell whether a wax, a cylinder is wax or celluloid? Someone else asked, how can you tell the difference between lacquer and vinyl? So do you have some like tips on just what to look for, for the different media types? Um, yeah, so the ARS guide to audio preservation, um, that's the, the first bullet point, uh, in the resource list has specifically a chapter on identifying these formats. So there's a wealth of information there with pictures. Um, it's really meant to be like, you know, common person, layman, you know, uh, intro, uh, to the format. So highly recommend that. Also, I believe it was University of Illinois. Um, they did like um, a preservation uh, kind of like guidebook. Uh, it's the Preservation Self-Assessment Program. Um, they have lots of wonderful pictures. If you just search for Illinois Library 
preservation self-assessment program and then like records or vinyl, like you'll find all these wonderful, um, just kind of like an ID guide almost for these things. So, but uh, you will get instances with, with cylinders where uh, it's not clear and it may not even be clear through historical research. You may need to do like material analysis to really figure it out. Cause it was kind of the wild west when these things were created <laughs> literally and, and figuratively. Yeah, you can kind of get that feel from the fact that they were using like old x-ray films to do it. Like it was kind of like whatever you could kind of get your hands on. And like I'm I'm of the generation that um, one of my toys, I've been thinking about this a lot because of this webinar, was the old like play school record player, like the one with the big chunky plastic, you know, records on it. And I think about that sometimes knowing like that was a record player. And I know people have that in gift, you know, thrift shops and stuff across the the country so it's funny to think about even records being played like that or um mcdonald's back in the day gave away free records in the mm -hmm. um whatchamacallit in the newspaper for the new mcdonald's song so yeah, uh, yeah. it's like yeah. you just think about back to that time and it's like it came in so many different formats that i think looking into that material data would be really interesting to see all the different types so yeah well, it is two o'clock so that flew by <laughs> so thank you so much dave for all that great information um, again, we created a resource sheet. We have your presentation um, in the on the website. This should be up on our website probably in just a few days. So I would keep an eye on that for sure. I put the link again in the chat in the survey. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and close out this program. But again, thank you. Um, we'll be back next week with another C2C Care webinar. So I hope you join us then. And then we'll be taking a break through 2025. So thanks. And we will see you all soon. All right, thank you. Bye.